Welcome to our Savvy Ladies Wednesday Wisdom webinar. My name is Maggie Montemuro and I'm the Marketing Coordinator at Savvy Ladies. If you have a question during the presentation, please type it into the chat box. And if you're joining us by phone, you can email your question to info at SavvyLadies.org. Today's presenter is Anita R. Johnson, founder of Money Wisdom for Women which provides financial advice to clients through consulting sessions, workshops, and conferences. She is also the radio host of Anita Talks Money. Anita is the author of two books, including Big Girls Don't Cry, Taking the Emotion Out of Finances. Anita has a strong commitment to educating her clients so they can make sound financial decisions. Thank you for joining us today, Anita, and I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm I'm glad to be here. And all of the ladies or, or gents or whoever that are out there that are listening, I'm glad that you're on the call today and that you're gonna that I encourage you actually to have pen and pencil ready. Uh, pen, pencil, paper ready because we're going to probably do some exercises. So I'm just really excited about uh about being here. So we're going to be talking about today uh, taking the emotions out of finances to reach your financial serenity. And financial serenity can mean a lot of things to different people. Um, as you see, I have um, our first slide here that talks about, you know, the cash flow, uh, a cash flow for college, investments, uh, financial planning, uh, strategies, uh, what's your estate goals, all of those things. And sometimes we can't find that serenity. We can't find that financial serenity. And so this mission and this goal here, my mission and my goal is, and my purpose, is to help you identify some of those unhealthy financial habits that keep you from building wealth, uh, building wealth, or even just planning or living comfortable uh, in whatever state you're in, whether it's in retirement or whether you're still working or getting ready for retirement, whether you have small ones at home, no ones at home, or some of them in college, married, single, it doesn't matter. And so my job is to help women and help people find those uh, and identify those unhealthy habits so that I can or you can uh, leave a legacy for your children. So that's really important. I, I find that leaving a legacy, and it's not necessarily can be wealth. It can be the knowledge of knowing things uh, and what you've learned, you pass that on to your children as well. So what I want you to do is right now, here's an opportunity for you to take about 30 to 60 seconds. We're going to take about 30 to 60 seconds, and we're going to be, I want you to talk to, to write down what, your story is, um, if you had all the money in the world, what would you do? I want you to think about that. So take about 30 to 60 seconds and think about what you would do if you had all the money in the world. I know what I would do, but I want you guys to think about that. So let's just take 30 or 60 seconds. We're going to be quiet so that you guys can think about it and write. I hope that um, you're writing some good things down. Okay, so you wrote those, you wrote what you would do if you had all the money in the world, and what would you do? And for me, I'll tell you what, what I would do. I would probably do a lot of traveling and do a lot of speaking engagements and just travel and speak if I had all the money and then probably and and then you know volunteer some time to uh maybe the hungry because that's one of my biggest things is uh, feeding the hungry so I would do a lot of traveling now sometimes when I ask this question when we'll say or people will say well I want to pay off some bills which is good um, or I want to buy my family a house, or I want to do this for this person, I want to do that for, for that person. But we never really think about doing things for ourselves. And so the, the, the thing to this 
the exercise is to for you to think about what you can do for yourself. And it's okay to think about your family, your kids, um, uh, sister, brother, all of those, but you want to put yourself at the top of the list uh, for for these things. So it's real. So I want you to think about that next time this question is asked um, of you, what is it that you would do? Now I'm going to tell you why, how and why I decided to help women identify their unhealthy financial habits. Years ago, when I was, uh, I've been in business since 1998, and one of the, and I used to do accounting and taxes. And a lot of women would come through my office, and um, whether they were married or whether they were single, doing their tax returns or they would be in business, and they would earn quite a bit of money throughout the year, but they would always end up um, – not having enough. They would always complain about not having enough money. What what is it that what is it that I'm doing that's not right or uh if I had a job I'm still at the same pay or I feel like I'm not being paid enough. And I guess everybody feels like that every every now and again with their with their uh jobs or even when they are self employed. And so I started thinking and there were two ladies, especially two ladies that came in, one who was a widow, uh, and she was in her 40s. She had just become a, a widow, and she was in her 40s, and she was doing the last tax return for her husband. But she didn't know what it looked like. And I thought maybe she was just playing. She just, oh, oh, no, I really don't know, because he put it in front of me, and I signed it. Nothing wrong with that, but I wanted her to know what it looked like. And so I that had me to thinking. Now, if she doesn't know, then some of the stuff that, you know, she is – going to be exposed to, which is taking care of her own finances, she's not going to know. And so that got me to thinking. And then another lady came in, and she happened to be in her 70s, and her and her husband were getting a divorce, and he was uh, ordered to give her half of his retirement. And um, she was going to get this check in a lump sum. And she was actually had been a housewife all her life uh, with him. Uh, she was 70, she had, I think they had been married 30-something years. She was 70-something, some, 70s, and she just didn't know what to do with the money. And so there was another way for, for me to help her. So that's when I decided that I wanted to do this and how I wanted to do it. And um, I've been doing it since about 2008. Now, what will you learn today? Okay, so you're going to learn how to decrease your unhealthy habits uh, and raising your healthy habits and giving um, giving them power and giving yourself power and serenity. Uh, the other thing is you're going to create a financial spending plan. We're not going to even think about it, but um, we're going to talk about a budget a little bit later, but we're going to be talking about a healthy financial spending plan. And then help women deal with emotional stress that often comes with their finances and turn their stress into positive energy. So those are the three objectives that we want to have today, helping women decrease unhealthy um, their unhealthy financial habits, effectively creating a financial spending plan, and help you with emotional stress. So as you are going through, as we are going through these slides, um, I want you to think about what actually causes you to have emotional stress. What does it feel like when you decide to buy things and you really can't afford it or you think you can't afford it or you put it on your card and you think, or your credit card and you think, okay, well, I'm going to pay it off next month or in three months or however, and then nothing happens, something something happens where you are not able to pay the amount off and you end up with a lot of debt. So let's think about that. I want you to think about that as we're going through this and put that to your pen and put that to your paper and then think about that. Now, the next thing, what are some of your unhealthy financial habits? Oh, my goodness. Um, so I want you to take here again, we're going to take some more paper and some more pencil and pen and unhealthy experiences with money. Have you had some unhealthy experiences with money? So think about that for a minute. Uh, I'm going to give you another 30 seconds, and you can write down. So think about have you had some unhealthy? Have you been uh, in your childhood? Were there some challenges in your childhood, in your in your the way your 
uh, parents um, negotiated, so to speak, uh, the finances throughout the house. How was that? Um, I can give you my experiences and some experiences that I find in clients. So let me give you my experience. And it wasn't really an unhealthy experience, and it could be an unhealthy experience. But I'll tell you, um, I came from a very small town. My, my parents were educators. And so at the time, my mother and my parents held accounts at different stores. So I was able to walk into different stores and say, okay, just put that on my account, on my parents' account, so to speak, and then my parents would pay for it without any question. And so um, uh, now I wasn't really overboard with it because my parents would stop me at a certain time. But I, that came into my adulthood. So when I got married, um, I would be like, oh, just put it on my husband's account. And he was like, okay, wait a minute, what's going on here? Or I would say, okay, well, my dad will just pay for it. And so my dad would often pay for it. And so um, that can be an unhealthy, that carries through, the, through to my uh, adulthood. And so that kind of made it difficult for me. Um, and I had to learn that, nope, you just can't put it on account and somebody else will pay for it. Uh, you have to do it. So think about that. You got, you know, I'm going to give you about 15 seconds to think about it. Jot down maybe three unhealthy experiences you may have had. You know, was, um, uh, was, the, was your dad the uh, breadwinner of the house or were you both, were your parents both the breadwinners and who actually controlled the money? Was there anybody that controlled it or were you in a bad relationship or in a relationship where you controlled or somebody else controlled? Or have you just been single or you just spent a lot of money? So think about that. I'm going to give you about 15 seconds to think about that and we're going to move on to the next one. All right, so um, hopefully you wrote down about three things there. What else is unhealthy thinking? I'm not good enough. Oh, my goodness. This is, I get this a lot with uh, some of the ladies that I meet with. I don't understand. I'm embarrassed. Um, not me. I don't know. Um, I feel like I'm crazy when I go into some of these financial planners. Um, what else is uh, – what can I do? This is all unhealthy thinking. It is all unhealthy thinking. And we as women have are, are natural nurturers and we want to be nurtured. Uh, and so what happens is, is we kind of leave our financial life to someone else um, to do instead of, you know, really getting in there and asking the right questions or even knowing what the right questions are and really not doing a lot of homework. Now, that doesn't make – that's and I'm generalizing because there are some women who get in there and they really do it, you know, they really get into their finance because later on in life, it's going to be about 50 to – over 50% of women at some point in time will take care of their own finances, whether they be single and never been married or whether they've been married and widowed or whether they be divorced. So they're going to have to handle your finance, your own finances. So it's better you get in there and you ask good questions. You try to get in and you do some research. research. Uh, if you want a financial planner, uh, if you need a financial planner, or some kind of uh, help, support, get some support, um, get referrals for support, be able to ask the right questions because this is your future. A, a prime example is negotiating a raise or negotiating a salary. You know, you go out and you get this new job, and they call you up and say, hey, you got this job, and we're going to we're gonna give it to you for $30,000. i am just making this number up. And you say, okay, no problem, but knowing in your heart you probably need fifty or you need help with daycare or you don't have or they don't offer benefits as far as um retirement benefits or matching in that or they don't have um health insurance or some of those things and so Instead, you take the job and then you're unhappy with the pay because you're t paying out a lot of money towards these other things when in the beginning you probably could have negotiated some of those things. And you'd be surprised. Human resource people say, hey, we offer this, but we will take this if they ask for it. 
So don't be embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed to get help, and don't be embarrassed that I'm not good enough. Walk into a financial planner's office, uh, have them show you, if you're into in the retirement st- stage, have them show you exactly what it is that you're go- that you need and and that you want. Okay. So um, no, the next one would be no spending plan, and we're going to talk about that, and no retirement plan, and no estate plan. So these are unhealthy habits, and these are some health, some unhealthy habits that you can change right today. No problems. We can do that. You can do that right today. All right, financial spending plan, no budgets. Why do you think uh, a budget is no good? Write down, take, here's another opportunity for you to take about 15 seconds to write down why you think a budget doesn't work. Okay, so a spending plan can help you manage your money more efficiently, live within your income limits, reduce and your reliance on consumer debt, and save you for things, save for things that you that you want. And so that's what we're going to be doing. I'm going to show you really quickly how to do a financial spending plan as opposed to a budget. Now, why doesn't a budget work? And you guys, I know you guys wrote down something in those 15 seconds why you think a budget doesn't work. One thing I can tell you is a lot of times when we decide that we're going to go on a budget, okay, we say, well, we buy food, uh, we buy clothes, uh, we have utilities, we have gas for our car, uh, we have insurance for our car, we may even have life insurance, we may even have some disability insurance, we may even have all kinds of different things. We have, If we have children, we got to buy clothes for children, we got school supplies, if they're in college, you know, all of that. So we say, okay, well, I think I spend this amount of money on blah, blah, blah. I think I spend this amount of money on blah, blah, blah. Well, I can tell you that a lot of times when you don't know the number and you kind of put a budget together, you decide you pull a number out of the hat. And so when you go to do your actual versus your budget, you find that you spent more on your budget. You've overspent. In most cases, you've overspent, and you find that um, – the budget is blown. I don't want to do it anymore. So that's why a budget doesn't work, and that's why we're going to do a financial spending plan. So one of the first steps that you want to take in in uh, a financial spending plan is to begin to track your spending, and we're going to do this over um, a a three month period. We're going to track we're going to track our budget within a three month period. And how do we tr- – we're going to track everything we spend. If you just take a piece, of, a piece of paper or something and start writing down everything you spend, anything you put into the soda machine, anything that you spend. And then after three months – and make sure that you're categorizing everything. Uh, and so once you do that, uh, once you start uh, averaging out your uh, – you've done it for three months, we're going to take the average – uh, we're going to take the average of those and that, and we're going to add about five or ten percent to that amount, and that will give you what you're spending in that category, and that's called a financial spending plan, and that is closer to what you spend as opposed to putting something, pulling a number out of the air. So maybe that number is close to the number that you pulled out the air, and maybe it isn't, but that's what we're going to be working on. That's where we're going to work from. And one thing that I didn't. Uh, put in that I can always uh, put it up again uh, put it up is the different categories and what you should be spending in each category like for instance housing that means rent or mortgage part of uh, how much should you spend per month on this and this is after you have uh, this is your net income 20 to 30 percent uh, utilities should be four to seven and food should be nine to fifteen Transportation, which is your car, and that means um, insurances and everything should be 6 to 20. Uh, Medical is 13%. Uh, Investments and savings, 5 to 10. And if you have any credit cards, 15 to 20% monthly installments. And then personal and miscellaneous, 5 to 10. Now, I didn't put this on the slide, but I will um, put this on the slide so that you guys can see it, uh, put it up again when I go back through. So anyway, that is what you should be spending on those different categories. Those housing is thirty to twenty to thirty, utility four to seven, food nine to fifteen, transportation six to twenty, 
medical 13%. So I'll go back over those again. So if you have any questions, go ahead and jot those questions down as we uh, as we are coming uh, when we come upon questions. All right, how do you handle uh, financial emotional stress? You're going to focus on the here and now. Uh, you're going to get support. You're going to face your financial demons. Uh, keep active. Stay focused. Stick on your financial spending plan. And also you're going to do a wish list. Now, how do you focus on the here and now? Do you need an emergency, travel, or college funds? That's how you're going to focus on the here and now. What do you need for right now? Do you need to get out of debt? Uh, what is it that you need most of all right now, today, right at this moment? And that's really important. So focus on the here and now. So as you are with your pen and paper, write down three things that can keep you, that you need to be focusing on right now as we, as we go through these slides. Get support. Face your financial demons. Facing your financial demons can keep you, can help you understand the why. Why are you doing this? Begin to look at, at your habits. What's happening when you make those financial decisions? When you're out and you, and you have a particular amount of money, uh, say you're out and you, you like to use cash when you're buying um, clothes, okay, because it keeps you on budget as opposed to using your credit card. But you see this fancy, dancy little thing that's over your the money uh, that you have in your pocket. Do you purchase it or do you put it on your credit card? Or you go to the ATM and pull more money out? What is it? What is really key? What are you thinking about when you do that? You have to think about that. What are you doing? What's really keeping you from investing? Okay, what is keeping you from investing in yourself? And as you as we're going, make sure that you're writing these things down. Get support. Do you need a CPA? Do you need a banker? Do you need a tax preparer? Do you need a state planner? Those people are important in your life. Fig figure out who you need to help you on this financial journey because it's very important. Keep active. Stay on task. Understand your finances. Spend, take, um, one of my things is to spend one day, have a date with your finances. Um, have a date. Understand your finances. Spend that time with them and understand. And then stay focused. Stay on focus. Uh, understand the why and the what. What are you working for? Uh, get a financial journal. Uh, journal every day. Okay, so when I'm working with people, I have them have they always I always give them a financial journal, and it's for finances only. How do you feel about your finances? What did you think about when you started spending that money? What is really going on with that? Uh, stick to your financial uh, spending plan, and I think we talked about it. Create a financial spending plan as opposed to a budget. Um, three months, an average. Uh, and then that's your true financial spending plan number. Um, wish list. Okay, what are you? What is your wish? Okay, so there's no genie in the box here, and so in the bottle. I think I may have spelled that wrong, but anyway, there's no genie, and um, so you can't wish anything. You have to actually say, okay, this is what I want to pay off. This is what I'm doing here. This is my understanding. Um, uh, of my finances, what is it that I want to pay off, and how will I get there, and what is the date that I want to pay that off? And I think that might be all, and so um, I guess this is a good time to have questions. I want you to go back to your list that you wrote while we were doing everything and um, uh, go through that, and maybe you have some questions in that area. Okay, thanks, Anita. That was great. Um, so as Anita said, if you have any questions, you can send them through the chat or email info at SavvyLadies.org. And we did have some questions that came in. So okay. this, this first one is, I find that when I receive money as a gift, such as for a birthday, I want to spend it on something I wouldn't normally buy for myself because it somehow seems less valuable. Is this mm. a bad habit and do you have any tips for that? Oh, wow. It's okay to splurge on yourself sometimes, and I don't think it's a bad habit. I think maybe depending on how much you're, you're, you are receiving, you may want to take half of it or part of it to spend on yourself and then ha and the other part to invest in something. And it could be investing into your emergency fund or your college fund if that's what you uh, are at or um, a travel fund. I, I don't know anybody that doesn't like to travel. 
And a lot of people don't have a travel fund, uh, and which which I like. And I've had clients who who have used uh, who put their money into their travel, their extra money into the, a travel fund. And so when they get ready to go traveling, they don't have a big trying to find money to travel. So you may want to do that. So pick something that yes, spend some money on yourself, but also pick something that you that will make you feel better uh, uh, down the line. Because we all like instant gratification, but it's the hard part, the patience that we need uh, for the long haul. Okay, thanks. Another question is, when I'm with certain friends, I tend to ignore my budget and spend a lot of money because I want to enjoy myself and fit in with their more extravagant lifestyle. Mm. What can I do to fix this? Oh, wow, that's a good question. Very good question. Um, and it's really funny because, and I guess it's not really funny, but it's also because I, I find peer pressure sometimes as well. And I usually stay with I set myself a budget within uh, before I go out with my friends or whether I'm uh, going out to dinner with myself or something. I set a budget for myself, and that is what I use to, um, that, that is that exactly what I use to go through to spend the money that I'm uh, using. And so it's important now, if you have financial goals and you have uh, things that you want to do, just think about those things. One habit that you might want to have is, okay, so these are my financial goals. Write them out. Write your goals the day that you want to do them, that you want to meet them. And then read them every day, you know, once in the morning and once at night. And definitely read them before you go out with your friends. So that will kind of keep you on track. So I think that might be a good way to understand, okay, I'm in my zone, this is my budget, and this is what I have to spend. And don't crave, uh, don't go to the extreme with your friends who have more extravagant taste than you. Okay, great. We had some questions come in about avoidance behavior, uh, about people mm. getting stressed about finances and really avoiding looking at their statements. So do you have tips on what they can do to face their fears? Wow. That's, a good, that's another good question because uh, we all don't want to face our financial fears. And that's the part of the when we talked about when I talked about facing your financial demons is that we don't and one of the things that you'll find in my book um, Big Girls Don't Cry is there's there's 10 steps to financial serenity and one of the steps is to make a date with your finances okay and is it 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 goes to like something like this it says okay remember the person that you're married to or the person that you're in love with right now how you would you love to be around them and things like that and so I want you to feel the same way about your finances. And so the only way that you're going to really care and want to know about your finances is that you have to spend time with them. And so you have to make a date to spend the time with the finances. And, yes, it can be a little daunting and it can be overwhelming. But if you need to do it with a, a – um, a glass of water with some lemon in it or some some kind of tea or something to and help you breathe through it, then just breathe through it. Just take the time before you start, you know, get gather all your paperwork, get your water, get your tea, whatever it is that you like to drink, um, and then breathe before you start and then dig in. But you got to spend that one once a week, one day a week, maybe it needs two, depending on how, how your finances are, and that same time, that same time every week, same day, same time every week, and then you get used to it. And if you need to, put it and schedule it into your calendar and have your calendar remind you about it. Okay, great. And I think we have time for one more question, um, which is about the spending plan. So three mm -hmm. months of tracking uh, expenses seems like like a long time. So do you have any suggestions for really sticking with it? Um, you, If you begin to track um, and working with a um, – if you want to work with someone, you know, maybe a financial coach or something to that effect or a financial planner, uh, someone gets you an accountability partner. So I believe um, – 
when I have when I've had my clients, I've always that's the very first thing that we do is we start tracking, and they start when they start tracking, they figure out how much money they're spending on certain things, and they'd be like, "Oh my gosh, I didn't know this was happening. I was spending this amount of money." So yes, it is a long time, but it, what it does, it gives you an average of what you're spending on certain things, so that you can track it a little bit better, and you can understand it a little bit better, and have a more true figure to your financial spending plan. So if you need an accountability partner, then get yourself one to make sure that you are doing it. And then just begin to track. And I find that when people start tracking, they are excited about it. Now, do you need to track every day? Some people do. Some people don't. You can actually save all your receipts. Some of us use our debit cards. Save your receipts and maybe do it that once a week um, and see what you're spending and categorize it. I would probably, you know, if if I had a new client that never done it before, I would probably say every day um, to do it. Uh, but if you're really good at it and, and keeping receipts and maybe doing it once a week, tracking and putting things together once a week, then fine, then do it that way. But I find when you start tracking, you you are like, oh, my God, I didn't know this was happening, and you continue to do it, and you'll find that your behavior will change because now you have to write everything down and your behavior will change of what you spend. Okay, well, thanks again, Anita, for such a wonderful presentation. Thanks to everyone who joined us today and asked some great questions. We hope you'll join us again. And thank you again, Anita. Thank you for having me.